Welcome to class today. I believe this is lecture 31. You, we are now in the home stretch of Math 150 multi variable calculus. And what I want to do for the last two weeks is you know, give us an opportunity to review some of the material we've done, talk a little bit about applications. You know, what might you do in classes beyond this? You know, how might you actually use this to solve problems that you care about? Okay. So in particular for today, I want to talk a little bit about difference equations. Before doing that, I want to just follow up a little bit on the library trip we did on Friday. Talk a little bit about, uh, there was a question to do spherical integration. So we'll add spherical integration. And then talk a little bit about Fibonacci numbers, which are a great example of difference equations. So difference equations are discrete versions of differential equations. In difference equations, you move forward in a discrete time step. So if you look at a lot of processes, uh, a lot of things can be described discreetly. If you want to do compound interest where you compound once a year, or once every six months, or once every month, this is a great example of something that's discrete. For some things, if it's sufficiently complicated, you, know, you might as well effectively model it as continuous. If you look at human births, human births is definitely discrete. When you consider how many billions of people there are, you can effectively model it as something continuous. And so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about how would you set up models for different equations and how would you solve them. You should have watched the video on <coughs> double plus one on applications of Fibonacci numbers and the generalization to gambling. There is a, unfortunately no way to fix this. It is a fundamental flaw in the system, but Vegas is thrilled that so many people independently discovered this. When I was young, my father actually wrote a computer program. He didn't know how to calculate the probability, but he could do a million simulations and estimate what was the probability you would go bankrupt for this math. And it's amazingly high. Uh, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, Bode's law. Uh, and so it basically says that if you look at the planets, then they're approximately given by the formula four plus X. And you know, I'm not going to go into all the details, but you know, basically given by the formula four plus three times two to the n. So there's this you know, strange almost doubling with a little constant shift in the beginning. And so when you use this to try to estimate where the planets are, if you look at Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Ceres, which is the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, and even up to Uranus, it seems to beautifully follow this progression. It's not perfect, but you it's a really interesting coincidence that so many of the initial planets, in fact, all of them, seem to satisfy this. Newton's law of gravity is one of the greatest achievements in scientific endeavor. In this ability to come up with a universal law, which you know, to the scale of the cosmos does a really good job. And so uh, have I given you the story of the planet that wasn't by Isaac Asimov to read? Okay, I'll, I'll send this later. It's one of my favorite of his you know, science uh, articles. And he talks about the discovery of the planet Uranus, which is one of the best examples of ass kissing in the history of the world. The person who discovered it decided to name it after his baby, which flattered the king enormously. The rest of Europe did not so much like the idea. Yes. Is that king George? It was King George's plan. Yes. Great ass kissing. Uh, the rest of Europe said, hell no, we're not letting you name the planet after your sovereign. And so the compromise was, well, Saturn is Jupiter's father, Uranus was Saturn's father. This app has been blocked. Okay, I have no idea what app has been running. And I got the Java update earlier, multiple people, I'm sorry, in Cap 2. So for a while, everything was going well, but then the orbit of Uranus was a little bit off. Same with some of the other planets, but mostly Uranus. So either there's something wrong with Newton's law, which worked for well over a century, or people could predicted maybe there's another planet. And they were trying to figure out where the planet is. The problem is you have so many different variables. You, know, you have the mass of the planet, you have the distance of the planet and whatnot. And so people use Bode's law to try to give a rough estimate of maybe the planet should be roughly over here looking at everything else. Let's look in this region. And using this to try to estimate what its mass would be, they eventually were able to predict where the planet Uranus would be and say, Point your telescopes here, you'll see a new planet. So I'll leave the rest for the article. It's a brilliant article. And then it talks about 
there were issues with the orbit of Mercury. And so if you just fix the orbit of Uranus by discovering the new planet, what is it natural to conject for the orbit of Mercury? What might fix the orbit of Mercury? If adding a new planet beyond Uranus fixes the orbit of Uranus, how could you fix the orbit of Mercury? Add another planet. Add another planet. Or between Mercury and the Sun. Why might it be hard to see a planet between Mercury and the Sun? Well, one is that it doesn't exist. But why else might it be hard? It's super bright. It's kind of hard to see. So, you know, you want to talk about great examples of bias. You know, the rock stars back then were the scientists. It was a much more, more civilized era. When you discover the planet Neptune, theoretically, people listen to you when you predict the existence of a planet between the Sun and Mercury. And the predicted planet was named Vulcan. This was well before Star Trek. Anybody know why it was called Vulcan? So hard, so God of the Forge. So they named the planet Vulcan, and they told people, this is when you should be able to see it. And so they trained their telescopes on it, and what happened? Uh, most of them, uh, fortunately, when it spawned up out to be looking directly into the not go blind. We also have grad students, and so we. What do you think happened when they changed the telescopes to look at them? Most saw nothing, but a few people claimed to have seen Vulcan. Well, if you believe that the planet is supposed to be there, don't you want to be the one who's credited with discovering the planet? And so this is a real example of bias influencing your measurement. And over time, as the telescopes got better and better and better, they could say, well, if there's a planet, it can only be this big, this big, this big, this big. And eventually, it was not large enough to account for the deviations in Mercury's orbit. This was eventually explained by Einstein equals mc squared. The gravitational field actually has mass associated to it, and that fixes things. I just wanted to add that you know, on the library. Uh, so there was a question to do some more spherical integration. So I have you know, just scoured the web you know, to look for some you know, good sites with good pictures. Uh, here is one that is using the mathematician's notation. V is the angle coming down from the z-axis. So I think it's cut off. I can draw a z. And then theta is the angle in the xy plane. And we have the relations x equals rho sine phi cosine theta, y equals rho sine phi sine theta, z equals rho cosine phi. And typically, uh, we have functions that only depend on your distance from the origin. Not always, but if those, if, if that is one of the ones you're looking at, it makes the calculations very nice. Remember, rho squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. All right, so we first we call the polar coordinates, I mean the spherical coordinates, and if I have a function f of x, y, z, I replace this with f of rho uh, sine phi cosine theta dot dot dot. And so I just, wherever I see an x, I put it rho sine phi cosine theta, wherever I see a y, I put it in y, wherever I see a z, I put it in z. And the hope is that you have something that only depends on x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So we have to then figure out, you know, what is the region we're integrating over? The nicest region is integrating over the whole sphere. Second nicest would be integrating over half the sphere. Then we remember, what is the volume L, what does dx dy dz become? dx dy dz or dv is just rho squared sine phi d rho d theta d phi. And the way you should view this is it's d rho times rho sine phi d phi times rho D theta. That's going to give you something that's going to have units B this cube. It's going to give you a volume. Now, when we're actually writing things down, let's put all the rows together. So we'll write it as rho squared sine phi, d rho d theta d phi. But really what's going on is these are the lengths, the rho sine phi d phi, the rho d theta. We set up the boundaries, and then we actually execute the integrals. So for example, you know, I just went online to find some problems. Now let's integrate the function e to the x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the three halves over the solid between the spheres one and four, which is in the first octant and which is above the curve. So you're depending on how much you want to do, you know, you can make these problems as bad as you want. I have no desire to do them. So, but you know, you could easily add stuff like this. 
So I want to find the stuff that's above the sphere of radius one and below the sphere of radius one. What's the radius of the other one? Two. So one way to do this is integrate over the sphere of radius two and then subtract the integral over the sphere of radius one. So I really, if I can do it for sphere of radius r, I then just take r equals two and subtract r equals one. So this is a great way to do the problem in generality. We could do in the first octant. This problem is, of course, it's very nice, it's very symmetric. But, all right, so let's try to do the first octant. So we have the integral, 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 rho squared sine phi d rho d theta d phi. Now, what is my function? I have e to the x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the three halves. What is x squared plus y squared plus z squared? Rho squared. What's rho squared to the three halves? So what would rho squared to the three halves be? Rho cubed. Rho cubed. So this would be e to the rho cubed. And you can see that this is basically someone is being kind to us. We have an e to the rho cubed times the rho squared d rho. Oh, OK. This is going to set up beautifully for a spherical integration. So now I have to do my integrals. So rho is going to go from 0 to r. And I'll take r to be either 1 or 2 when I'm done. Now we're going to figure out phi. I want to be in the upper octant. So this is the octant of all positives. So how far does phi go? Phi goes from 0 to what? I want to stay in the upper octant. Well, phi is 0, I'm at the north pole. When do I hit the south pole? Pi. When do I hit the equator? So I would go, phi would go from zero to pi over two. Now I have my theta and I want to stay in the upper octant where everything is positive. So if I take theta from zero to two pi, I go all the way around. So what would I want theta to go from? Zero to pi, I'd go halfway around. So pi over two would go a quarter of the way down. So this is going to give me, I think, one quarter. And I had one half of the other one, that's going to give me one eighth. So if you look at the total angle, you know, I have you know, theta is in zero to pi, the p is in zero pi. So this gives me 2 pi squared you know, for the whole rectangle of theta phi. Plus, we have theta in 0 pi halves, b in 0 pi halves. That gives uh, pi squared over 4. This is 1 8. And again, we want the first octave. We should have something that's 1 8 of the measurement of the whole thing. So this looks very reasonable in terms of setting up my balance. What's nice now is I can split this integral up into three integrals because I'm integrating over a rectangular box. It seems strange to say I'm integrating over a rectangular box when I'm integrating over a sphere. But in spherical coordinates, what does a sphere look like? It looks like a box. So I can write this as this is the integral theta goes from 0 to pi halves, and I'm doing my theta integrals, which is going to be d theta. And my phi integral goes from zero to pi halves of sine of phi d phi. And then my rho integral, zero to r, e to the rho cubed, rho squared d rho. And because I know what's coming, I'm going to put a three here and a one third there. And now this is just setting up to do the u substitution nicely. What's the theta integral we're going to do us? So we integrate d theta from zero to pi halves. That gives us pi halves. So this would be pi halves. The next one is we integrate sine 
from the physical side. Sorry? Negative cosine. Because the cosine is minus sine. So this is going to be negative cosine of phi at zero and pi halves. And then one third will have e to the rho cubed, because the root of e to the rho cubed is e to the rho cubed times three root squared at zero and r. Right? Cosine of pi halves is zero, cosine of zero is one, because of the minus sign now it becomes a plus one. So this should become pi six e to the r cubed if I can determine. And so this is how you would do a you know, standard spherical integral. If I wanted to integrate between the sphere of radius one and the sphere of radius two, I would plug in i equals two and then subtract the value in i equals one. If you now want to do it over a cone, it gets a little bit more involved. Yes? Is there any reason you couldn't do, like, make that one be able to like, have you could, you could also do a bow from one to two. You could absolutely do it like this. There's, there's lots of different ways of doing the calculation. I'm just trying to break it up into the simple things. You know, the whole thing. You absolutely could do both those from to two. Uh, the next problem that they have was a solid is described in spherical coordinates by the inequality rho less than equal to two sine phi. I'm assuming most people have not done polar integration in calc two where they give you r as a function of theta, and then you do this one half r squared to theta. It sounded all familiar. Okay, so I'm not gonna say, you know, too much about, you know, something like this, other than not surprisingly, you know, if you wanna get a picture of this, go to Mathematica. And Mathematica has a beautiful thing called spherical plot 3D, which will at least give you what the shape looks like. And now your bounds for rho are going to depend on your bounds for rho. B. So when you do your integration, since rho depends on phi, you have to choose your value of phi first. And then for that fixed value of phi, your values for rho will go from zero to two sine phi. And the nice thing is two sine phi is always going to be a positive number. This is good enough having negative radius. So if you want extra credit, try to figure out what is the volume of this region. Do the integration, figure out what is the range what's theta going to be, what's phi going to be, what's rho going to be, and do the resulting integral. And that will give you this three-dimensional shape. One of the things that's nice about you know, using Mathematica to do stuff like this is it has a lot of wonderful, wonderful features. And so when I come down here, here's the shape. If you click on it, you can actually you know, rotate the shape around and try to get a sense Actually, almost looks like a fighter from Cloud City. Lots of, so that's the second reference for today for this short count. Uh, looks like a, almost a strange bagel with donut that has a pretty good roll, but it's, it's absolutely wonderful that you can do these three dimensional rotations and try to get a feel for what you're shaking. Yeah. It's tough to say because the computers are now so great that they do these so well. We're actually going to see in a few moments. Uh, just how good computing power is when we get to the Fibonacci. You're in college. Well, um, we did, but only on Mondays to Fridays because we didn't have enough electricity to have seven days a week. We needed people to be you know, turning the dynamo with their hands. No. Uh, when I did my senior thesis, I was working in the, as a reference librarian as my student job in Michael Microfiche. And the boss allowed me to have programs for my thesis running in the background over the weekend. So long as I showed up Monday morning and discontinued all programs before their ship started. And so I spent you know, several weeks having parts of my thesis just running. And this is similar to the library trip where it took a tremendous amount of effort. You know, it took weeks to generate all the data I needed. I can generate it now in easily less than an hour. It's amazing the power that's available to individuals. If you ever want to see a great summary of just how well computers and graphics evolve, look at a YouTube video on the evolution of man and football and just see how far it's come in 25 years. Uh, it's almost indistinguishable now from 
the games that are being played. Right. So going back to the electric proper. All right. So what I want to do is I want to talk about Fibonacci numbers and recurrences. There's a bunch of problems that you know, we're going to do. I'm just going to list a couple of ones here that you can always just look at the slides and just pause the video. We're not going to talk about them too much. How many people have never seen the Fibonacci numbers? All right, so there's an explicit formula for the Fibonacci numbers, Binet's formula. We're actually going to prove that today. This allows you to jump to any Fibonacci number. As the second factor is less than one in absolute value, as n gets very, very large, it tends to zero. The first factor is going to become essentially uh, your Fibonacci number, the one over root five, one plus root five over two to the n, the golden mean, is going to be so close to the nth Fibonacci number that the nth Fibonacci number is essentially whichever integer is closest to them. The second is very, very negligible. I'm going to skip this one over here. And so there's a lot of different ways of defining Fibonacci numbers. The main is you have the recurrence relation fn plus one is fn plus fn minus one, but you can have different initial conditions. You know, one set of initial conditions is one, two, three, five, and the next number would be eight. And so on. If you use this as your definition, the Fibonacci's have a remarkable property. Every integer, every positive integer, can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. The more common definition is f0 equals 0, f1 equals 1, f2 equals 1, and so you get 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. If I use this as my definition, you get the Binet formula we had a moment ago, but you lose the fact that every integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci's. Well, I've got two ones. If I give you a number like six, I can write as five plus the first one or five plus the second. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give a couple of proofs of Binet's formula and just talk to you about how we can solve recurrence relations. So we have Fn plus one, is fn plus fn minus one. Do you agree that this means fn plus one is at most two fn? Because the Fibonacci numbers aren't decreasing. So if I replace fn minus one with fn, I've made things larger. So fn grows slower than two to the n. Similarly, fn plus 1 is greater than or equal to 2fn minus 1. So every time I increase my index by 2, I at least double. At least double every two indices. So faster than root 2 to the n, because root 2 times root 2 is 2. So you know, it may be a little bit off for the first index or two, but we get, at least if n is greater than or equal to two, the square root of two to the n is less than equal to fn is less than equal to two to the n. Let's guess this is the method of divine inspiration, that fn is equal to r to the n. We know it's growing faster than root two to the n. We know it's growing slower than r to the n. So maybe it goes at some intermediate rate r to the I don't know what r is, but let's see if we can figure out what that is. What I'm trying to show you is that this is a reasonable guess. You know, I know that it's growing at some exponential rate. It's growing at least as fast as one, two to the n. It's growing slower than two to the n, so somewhere in between. So we would then get r to the n plus one equals r to the n plus r to the n minus one. This is called the characteristic equation, characteristic polynomial. Well, I can bring all the r's to one side, and everything has at least an r to the n minus 1. So I can factor this as r to the n minus 1, r squared minus r minus 1 equals 0. So r equals 0, which is boring. Because if r equals 0, then just every term is 0. Or r equals 1 plus or minus square root of 5 over 2. How did I get 1 plus or minus 5 over 2? What did I use to get that? Okay. 
Sí, a Corvar Corvar. And then what you see is, well, if r to the n solves this relation, so does five times r to the n. Because I would just multiply every term by five. So would one fifth r to the n. So I could multiply either of these roots by any constant and it would still work. As a nice algebra exercise, what you should do is you should show if you have two roots that work, any linear combination of them works. So the general solution is going to be the nth Fibonacci number is C1 R1 to the n plus C2 R2 to the n. And if R1 to the n and R2 to the n both satisfy the characteristic polynomial, then when you substitute this in, you can just group them separately. So I strongly encourage you to do the algebra. Well, now we just need to figure out what are C1 and C2. Well, we know F0 equals zero, so that's just C1 plus C2. F1 equals one, that's C1 R1 plus C2 R2. So from the first equation, this should be you know, similar to the Lagrange multiplier. We now have a system of equations we need to solve. What do we get from C1 plus C2 equals zero? So what information does that give us? C1 has to be negative C2, or I prefer to write C2 as negative C1. Because you, I like to do things in terms of the lower index. Doesn't matter. When I substitute that into the next one over here, that would then give me C1 R1 minus R2 equals one, or C1 is one over R1 minus R2. And when you do the algebra, it's one over root five. And so we can write the nth Fibonacci number as one over root five, one plus root five over two to the n minus one over root five, one minus root five over two to the n. And this is the golden mean. Years ago, the record asked a couple of mathematicians, what's your favorite constant and why? And with a straight face, I said the golden mean because among its many remarkable properties, it's equal to the reciprocal of its own inverse. Can anybody give me another number that's equal to the reciprocal of its own inverse? Another number. So is zero equal to the reciprocal of its own inverse? Can't do the, can't do the reciprocal of the inverse of zero. So one works. What are the numbers equal to the reciprocal of its own inverse? Negative one, what else? No, there's one number that's not equal to the reciprocal of its own inverse, exactly. except for zero. So while the Fibonacci numbers and the golden means have many remarkable properties, being equal to the reciprocal of its own inverse is not one. And this is shared by almost every number. What really matters here is that one minus root five over two is less than one in absolute value. So when we take high values, high powers of this, it's going to be negligible. So the nth Fibonacci number is essentially whichever integer is closest to the first part. So this is a great way to just jump to any Fibonacci number. So in 140 today, when we were talking about Fibonacci numbers, the question was, imagine I tell you your entire grade for the semester, actually for your entire year of college, your four years, is to calculate a millionth Fibonacci number by hand. No calculators, no computers. Would you be willing to take this? You'll graduate with A pluses in every class, sooner than allowed, every possible way. You have four years to write down the millionth Fibonacci number. So let's show you. You want to get a sense of is something reasonable? And so uh, you know, Mathematica has a built-in Fibonacci number command, so I can actually calculate the, the millionth Fibonacci number. Using the built-in command, Mathematica has been a formula program uh, The timing says, you know, how long does it take you to do this calculation? The timing is zero. Basically, it's instantaneous because it knows it. Okay. You could ask, how many digits is the, and is the millionth Fibonacci number? So the millionth Fibonacci number 
is about 208,000 digits. The 500,000 Fibonacci number is about 100,000 digits. So if you look at how many digit operations you need to do to get from the 100,000, I'm sorry, the 500,000 to the million, each one of them has at least 100,000 digits. You've got 500,000 numbers. So we're talking about a million, billion, 50 trillion. So it's about five times 10 to the 10. We calculated how many seconds there are in, in your college career. 360, sorry, 3,600 seconds in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365.25 days in a year, because you will get the leap year. Four years of college, that's 10 to the eight. So if you can do one digit addition a second, that's not enough. If we had something of the form five times 10 to the 10, and that's a little bit of an underestimate. Yes. Um, even if you're a super senior, I don't think it's going to help even with that little gap here. You're, you're going to have to very quickly be at the point where you're able to do more than 100 digit operations a second. And you're, in terms of just writing things down. So if you want, take 10 minutes today and see how far you can get just by hand with adding Fibonacci numbers. I actually think you should do things in base two rather than base 10. I think it would be a little bit easier to avoid making mistakes. But you'll then have to worry because the numbers are going to take longer. And I'll give credit to whoever gets the most digits correct in 10 minutes. But you know, the point of this is these calculations are quite hard. Uh, a little bit later, I tried to have a little computer program to just calculate things. Here was a you know, short little code. And so what I'm going to do is I start off with zero and one, and then for two to max, I calculate my new number is my lower plus upper. I replace the value of lower with what was upper and upper with my new number. So basically I just add my two previous numbers and I store that new value in upper and the value that was in upper now moved to lower, and I just keep repeating. So if I want to do the first 10,000 numbers, this will give me my 10,000 Fibonacci number. Before it was instantaneous, this is taking 0 0.0156 seconds. If I want to go up to 100,000, it takes 0 0.17 seconds. If I want to go up to a million, and this is the computer you're doing everything by hand, one at a time at a time, doing all the additions. I think it was about five seconds, 4.56 seconds. I will have the computer just running in the background because the computer should always be working. I have to do you know, 10 million. Can somebody give me a lower bound on how long it will take to do 10 million? No. Okay, give me a better lower bound, knowing that it took 4.5 seconds to do one million. Fine. Okay, but there's a better lower bound you can do. Well, you can do better than that. Yeah, it'll be at least 45 seconds because it's going to be harder to do the bigger stuff. So you know it's got to be more than 45 seconds. So all the other the lower bounds, but a cheap lower bound is 4.5. You could actually do a plot and you know, try to like method of these squares and you know, record how long does it take to do 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 400,000, 800,000. Get enough data points to try to extrapolate how long is it going to take to do this so what I want to do now is I want to shift gears, go back and talk about generating functions. So we've spent a lot of time in class talking about writing down sequences and series. And I want to show you some applications. I think for your homework, you had to calculate certain fractions for today. Or two. And you know, these fractions should be quite strange since you're decimal expansion. These all came from evaluating generating functions and interesting things. So let's form the generating function g of x as the sum of f and x to the f. Now, you might think that this is a strange thing to do because, well, I'm just putting everything down. Um, I don't even know what the Fibonacci numbers are. How can I create this function? Well, I do know what the Fibonacci numbers are because I know they start off, you know, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and I have an explicit formula. So I know every Fibonacci number. I just don't know that I know them. I can't write them down exactly, but I have relations for them. We know the Fibonacci numbers are growing slowly.
lower than two to the n, right? So if x is less than one half an absolute value, this will conflict by the comparison space. So this is one of the reasons why we spent all that time talking about convergence. We know without even proving what the Fibonacci numbers are, the n Fibonacci number is less than two to the n, so convergence. So we have fn is less than two to the n, converges if the absolute value of x is less than two to the n. So the conversion of the chicken chicken is the same as the absolute value. And so I have my generating function. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at fn plus one x to the n plus one. And I use my relation for fn plus one, it's fn plus fn minus one. And if you look at this, this looks a lot like the generating function g. Where g is defined as the sum of you know, fn x to the n starting at n equals one. What is this starting at here? It's not starting at one, it's starting at two. Because I have n plus one x to the n plus one. What's the lowest degree of fn? Great. So what this really looks like is this looks like g of x minus f1 x minus f2 x squared. So that sum is very close to g. If I look at this over here, I want to have the index of f the same as the power of x. My index of f is n, my power of x is n plus 1. How should I write x to the n plus 1? I want the index and the degree to be the same. How can I write n plus one, x to the n plus one? So, so much of math is in algebra is trying to figure out how can I write things in I want to get g of x, yes. Yeah, write as x to the n times x, and then we'll pull out an x. How can we write this? We have f so n minus one x to the n plus one. How should I write x to the n plus one? So I want to have the index of f the same as the degree of x. My index of f is n minus one. What do I want my degree of x to be? n minus one. So how should I write x to the n plus one? I want x and minus one, I've got x to the n plus one. Yes. X to the n minus one over x to the n plus one. Yeah, they're not over, so times x squared. Okay. Right? And then we would just pull out the x squared. Again, so much of that is just looking at the algebra and finding how can I write it in such a way. And so now, I play some games, I pull out the x and the x squared. And then these are very close to my function g. The first one is missing two terms. The second one is missing one term. The third is missing nothing. And so I can write it as g of x minus f one x minus f two x squared equals x times g of x minus f one x plus x squared times g of x. We can solve for g of x. So you put all the g of x's over on one side and you divide. You should go through and do the algebra slowly. And then we get g of x is x over one minus x minus x squared. So I have my generating function. I might say, hey, this looks a lot like a geometric series. Like you might have x over one minus r. If I were to do that, what would r equal? So I want to write this as one over one minus r. What would r be? x plus x squared. So I could try to expand it using the geometric series, and I would get x over 1 minus r is going to be x times 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed plus dot dot dot. Well, unfortunately, this is going to become really bad. As I start to expand x plus x squared squared plus x plus x squared cubed plus dot dot dot, as I expand it out, I get 1 plus x plus x squared the next term is going to be x squared plus 2x cubed plus x to the fourth. The next term will be x cubed plus 3x to the fourth plus dot dot dot. And you see that 
If I want to look at, say, the x cubed term, I can get x cubed terms coming from the x plus x squared squared as well as the x plus x squared cubed. So this becomes very painful for trying to just get what's my coefficient of x, what's my coefficient of x squared, what's my coefficient of x cubed. This is not pleasant to find the Taylor series expansion. Even though it's wonderful to notice that I could view this as a geometric series with ratio x plus x squared, the algebra is just painful. And so much of life is trying to find the good ways to do things. Hopefully you remember the partial fractions from Calc 2. This is one of the most hated topics. Here's an application. Use partial fractions on this. And now I can expand each one using the geometric series format. And now there's going to be no cross-contamination. And so when I do that, boom, Binet's formula now pops up. And so this is another way to get Binet's formula. And then the formulas I gave you were evaluating the generating function like 1 over 100 or 1 over 1,000. And that's going to be enough to add and get these beautiful you know, series expansions where your decimals are like strings of Fibonacci's or integers. You're walking know, games you can play like this and choose these fractions. Right. So what I want to do for the last part is we had the video for double plus one. So I'm not going to go over that, but that's a great application of a generalization of the Fibonacci numbers. Nice introduction to some basic probability, some applications, trying to model real world problem, and that sometimes it's easier to calculate the probability that something doesn't happen than the probability that something does happen. And you know that some of the probabilities has to be one. Is it possible if I flip my coin that it lands on its side? Theoretically, so I really just want to toss some coins, have, okay, there's heads, tails, and sides. For all practical purposes, we don't really have to worry about sides. Right. What I want to do for the last is an extremely unrealistic model of real populations. Right. Is there anybody who is studying biology here? Right. Good. So nobody will be able to immediately introduce to this. Okay. So I think baby wheels are called cows. And in the interest of making the language a little bit easier, I'm always going to talk about a pair of wheels. So the model is the following. Time moves in discrete steps of one year, and at the start of the year, that's when everything interesting happens. So new wheels are born. Each pair of wheels that are one year old give birth to two new pairs of wheels. Each pair of wheels that's two years old gives birth to one pair of wheels. No other wheels give birth. When you turn four, you die, and you don't die before you turn four. And so the question is, can you describe how many wheels there will be as time passes? Do you think the wheel population is going to expand or contract? Well, hopefully it's putting in the human bias and beliefs. So I just want to expand or contract. So each pair of wheels gives birth to two new pairs when you're one, and then one new pair when you're two. So how many new pairs of wheels come from one pair? Three. Two when you're one year old, and then one when you're two years old. So each pair of wheels generates three new pairs of wheels. So you should actually have the wheel population going quite fast. So we want to write down a recurrence relation that describes how many wheels we have of different ages as a function of time. This is clearly going to be a multi variable problem we have there's lots of different things that we care about. We're going to have a four vector. So we'll have how many newborn wheels. So these are the wheels that are zero years old, one year old, two years old, three years old. Why don't I care about how many wheels are four years old? They're all dead. Okay, So we don't have to worry about them. So I claim that the easiest thing to think about is how many wheels are one year old in year n plus one. So if you want to know how many people are one year old in 2022, what do you need to know? How many people were born in 2021? So if we want to know how many wheels are one year old in year n plus one, what would that be? So how many wheels are one year old in year n plus one? 
as a function of the real population of the given group, what would it be? It would just be a, and I'm going to write it in the long form as one times a n plus zero times b n plus zero times c n plus zero times b n. Because this is going to allow me to write it as a matrix. Again, this is to try to motivate what you might do in linear algebra. How many wheels would be two years old in year n plus one? Or the answer. How many would be two years old in a year and plus one? So if I want to know how many people are two years old in 2022, I need to know what? How many people were born? How many people were born in 2020? Because nobody dies until they're four. So what would be the answer? How many wheels? Uh, two years old in year n plus one. It would just be one times bn. And so I'll write this in the long way as zero times an plus one bn plus zero cn plus zero bn. And then similarly, those that are three years old would be just one times cn. So I can put in the zeros every place else. And now the interesting one how many wheels were born? in year n plus one. So what would that be? Yes. Two a n. Not two a n. Because two a n would mean that the wheels who are zero years old. So two b n. It would be one b n. Maybe two B N. And so they'll give, you know, I think they'll give us right at the very end of the year, and we'll just mark it this way. So we can write this in matrix. So we let V and B uh, back to A and B and C and D. N. And this is clearly multi variable. And we have something with four components. Then Vn plus one is just A times Vn. And so if you just keep lab events repeating, since Vn plus one is A Vn, simply we get Vn is A Vn minus one. So Vn is A times B. Vn plus one is A Vn, which is A times A times Vn minus one which is a squared times bn minus one. So if you just keep marching down, you see that the power of a plus the index of b always adds up to n plus one. So if we go all the way down, we get bn plus one, it's just an plus one times b zero. So if I want to figure out what's going on as time passes, I just need to figure out what is the high power of this matrix. And so going back to Mathematica, Here's my matrix. And then I'm going to look at, you know, 10th power. And so there's my matrix to the 10th power. I can look at my matrix to the 100th power. It's getting bad. I look at it to the 1,000th power, it's getting even worse. But we can actually solve this. If you remember the ellipse, if the ellipse was aligned with the coordinate axes, we knew what to do. If the ellipse was not aligned, this wasn't done in your high school class. If we saw a way, if we just like lean back at 45 degrees, we'll be fine. We can do the same thing for matrices. When you have a matrix like this, it turns out that we have a way to diagonalize the matrix by changing coordinates. And then we can compute high powers of the matrix very rapidly. So it turns out problems like this can be solved very easily. The last thing I want to just quickly say is for those of you who have any knowledge of biology in the real world, this model should suck. Right? Is it plausible that everybody dies exactly at four years? Is it plausible that everybody has exactly two no? So what you could do is you could say, let's replace this one with maybe 98% lift. And then maybe going into the next year, maybe 93% of those. And maybe again, not always two. Or even better, what you could do is you could do a random variable. And you could say, 
I'm going to choose a number randomly from maybe 0.5 to one to represent what fraction of the real survived at the end. And then you have a matrix where the entries have a given structure, but they're chosen randomly. And now what you need to do is you need to understand the product of random matrices. And this becomes an incredibly challenging problem. How do you understand a generic product of random matrices? And you can start to see some of the tools of advanced probability when I'm going to come in. Uh, basically, the solution is that's uh, being recorded, so I won't use stupidity, but just screw it. You know, don't try to solve it exactly. Numerically simulate it. And then do a bunch of simulations and say 95% of the time, my results lie in this band. So if I have to predict what's going on, this is where I think we would be. All right, so this is a good place to stop. We will do the battle of Trafalgar uh, and differential equations in the next class.